Um, but for now, I shall stop waffling and I will introduce DC, who's going to give you a talk on five scientific tools that will blow your mind. Cool. Right. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, screens up So basically, a little bit of where does this come from? Like, so why am I giving this talk? Leading into mass spectroscopy, then covering uh, measuring gene activity, uh, heading on to gravimeters, i.e. measuring gravity, and then finally finishing up with atomic force microscopes. So, so OK, where does this come from? Um, I currently work in IT, but when I was young and needed the money, I did a PhD in genetics. Um, I, I did a lot of techniques for this. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the XKCD comic, um, The Best Thesis Defense is a Good Thesis Offense. So at the end of your PhD, um, you have, in the UK anyway, you have two experts who they try and pick holes in all of the work you've done. And I knew that one of the guys who was going to be uh, assessing me, he liked to trip people up on how techniques worked. So I spent the whole PhD, whenever I came across a technique, just learning exactly how it worked because I knew it would help me out at the end. So that's where this comes from, effectively, just a fascination with all these little weird techniques. Um, disclaimer, um, it's been a while since I've done sciencing professionally. So there's a lot of these techniques which are maybe a bit old and the cool kids are doing funky new things. So uh, yeah, disclaimer there. These are the ones I worked with, not necessarily what's state of the art. OK, so first off, uh, NMR. Um, you may know NMR from such hospitals as uh, MRI machines. So these are uh, the machines that produce the kind of the very cool uh, live scans of bodies where you can see the brain and all the organs and things. Um, these are based on uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'm going to talk a bit about how it works because it's freaking incredible. Basically, it works with aliens. It's, it's magic. So this, this was the machine... For those who've got the actual monitors, this was the machine which introduced me to NMR. Uh, at the time, it was the most powerful one in the UK, and it's, it was pretty cool. Um, the health and safety briefing for this machine was simply epic. So um, I was told I had to take all the metal off because it contains a giant magnet, and I went through like wanding with a, um, uh, a metal detector to check out nothing on me. Because they'd had, they'd had a case with a, another machine where a guy had got shoes with traditional iron nails in, and he hadn't realized this, so he'd taken the rest of his metal off. But then when he went near the machine, it ripped the iron nails through his foot through the shoe and onto the machine. The magnets these things are dealing with are truly incredible. So yeah, best, best health and safety demonstration ever. Um, so yeah, back to this. Uh, NMR, MRI, was invented in the 40s. And I'd, I'd say, yeah, the, the common way you'll know it is, is hospitals. But how does it work? Um, it is literally the hardest parts of maths, physics, chemistry, and biology in one topic. It's probably the most interdisciplinary topic I've ever come across. It's, it's incredible. Like how it was invented, I, I have no idea. Complete, massive respect to the people involved. So first, quantum physics. Um, OK, quantum. Everything is spinning. So atoms have, have spin. And there are two types of spin that are important. The first is nuclear spin, which is the spin of the protons and neutrons. And then you've got electronic spin, which is the spin of the electrons. Now, in some atoms, they don't cancel out. So um, they're called unbalanced. Um, and those are the ones that are useful for NMR. So in the presence of a magnet, um, these spinning atoms act like tiny magnets, and they line up to face with the magnetic field. So whilst they're spinning in all these weird directions, if you put a very strong magnetic field in, in, in place, then they align to, to work with the field. So here is my fantastic PowerPoint animation. So you've got, some, you've got some atoms spinning in different directions, and then you introduce a very strong magnet, and then this causes the atoms to all line up and, and go with the field. Then what you do is you introduce a radio. So you, 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 you um, flood it with uh, electromagnetic energy, with radio energy. And when you hit um, the right amount of energy, and I'll get to that in a second, um, the atoms are able to um, flip their spin back to their original state rather than the magnetized state. If you then take the radio away, they flip back and they emit the energy that they just absorbed to get them there. So what you do is you detect that energy. You detect that radio wave that's coming off, and you work out uh, where it was in your sample and how much energy came off. And uh, that tells you where it is. But the important thing it tells you is um, the amount of energy required. Because so the amount of energy required to flip a spin state is, is different depending on what's nearby. So you've got something called electronic shielding, which is the effect the electron cloud has on the, the nucleus. Now, different atoms will have different shielding, and so they'll require different energy to be able to flip them. But most importantly is atoms will be affected by nearby atoms. So a hydrogen atom connected to a carbon atom will require a different amount of energy to a hydrogen atom connected to an oxygen atom. So by knowing how much energy it takes to flip the state, you can work out what was actually near that atom at the time when it, when it flipped. 
So what you get out of a, an NMR trace is this. You get a, a signal wave, and this is it, what's called in the, the time domain. And I, I, I don't understand that bit. I'm not a mathematician. What you want to do is put it into what's called the frequency domain. So instead of seeing the, the, the signal over time, you want to see the, the frequency and the power that, that came out of it. And how do you do this? Mathematics. So um, as far as I can tell, it is mostly magical. But if you ask a mathematician, it's actually Fourier transforms, which, again, I can't explain, but someone here will be able to. Um, and what you get at the end is you get this trace which shows you the frequency and the amount of uh, energy, at the amount that came out at that frequency. And at this point, you can start to do analytics. So you, can, you might be able to say that, OK, I know that this peak corresponds to water. And then you can start you know, knowing and, and picking apart the different things in NMR. So how is this useful? How does it get us pictures like that from MRI machines? Well, that, so an MRI machine is effectively a fairly low-resolution NMR machine, and it measures the, um, the water across the body. So if you think um, different tissues will have different water contents, you've got bone, which will probably be fairly low, blood fairly high, and um, by measuring the water uh, throughout the cell live, you get a, a fairly good image of what's going on in the body. But because it's all just magnetism and radio waves, there's, there's no risk. It's not ionizing. It's not like x-rays. So you use NMR as sort of to get a picture of what's going on live in the cell. Something called functional MRI, which is fan fascinating, which what it does is it measures the difference between uh, oxyhemoglobin and just hemoglobin. So it can tell when uh, a cell is using oxygen. So what you do is you show someone a picture, and then you look at their brain, and where their brain is using oxygen, that part of the brain is currently active. So you can start to work out which parts of the brain correlate to uh, what stimuli. And that, that gives you a whole bunch of quite interesting experiments you can do. It's also used for samples, so I'll talk more about this with the mass spec section, but you can take a sample and very accurately work out what's inside there, you, even down to kind of uh, atom level. Um, it's very useful for protein structure, so um, proteins that you can't get the structure of by other ways, you can use NMR to work out what atoms are nearby and start building up the, the structure of the protein. Uh, what I used it for was um, NMR where you take a sample, take an, uh, do an NMR of your sample, then add something and do it again and see what changed. So I was looking at proteins and trying to find out where things were binding on that protein. So you take a sample of the protein, you get the atoms, then you add the thing you think will change, and some of those atoms shift because there are new electrons in their electron clouds. And you know that that's where the thing you're looking at is binding to your protein, so that was, that was how it helped me. Right, on to mass spectroscopy. You, know, you may know mass spectroscopy from airports. So after they do the kind of swabs of your equipment and things and put them in a machine, uh, that machine is a mass spectrometer. Um, what it basically tells you is what's in a sample. It breaks down a sample and tells you what's actually in there. Uh, how does it work? So basically, you ionize a sample. So you give it a charge, you break it down and, uh, and give it a charge, and then you use a, a spectrum of power, hence mass spectroscopy, to select the ions at different energies and masses so you know how heavy it is and how charged it is. Uh, and then you measure it. So there are different types of mass spectroscopy, but basically they all break down into these three, three stages, uh, creating ions, uh, splitting ions, and then measuring them. And there are various different ways to do each stages. Uh, the one I came across with quite a lot is called electrospray. So what you do is you get a charged nozzle, and you squirt your sample through there. And as it goes through the nozzle, it ionizes because the nozzle's charged, but it also disperses. And then you funnel it into your detection thing. So that's quite a, a crude way of doing it. Um, it works, but it's, yeah, it's cheap. Um, my favorite is uh, using a laser, obviously. And uh, in this, you get your sample. You hit it with a laser beam, and that causes the ions to break off. And then you direct those into your machine. Um, and then you, you, then you have to uh, separate them. So um, ions have mass and charge, so um, what you're trying to do is apply different electric fields and the ions will behave differently depending on how heavy and how charged they are. So you can, uh, you can select for them that way. By putting them in a field, some of them will, will go one way, some will go another way, and depending on where you put your detector, you can catch different ions. Uh, there's another one called quadrupoles, where you have four electrodes and you create kind of overlapping um, electric fields. And then by varying the voltage on the fields, you can select for different, uh, different ions going through. Because say, if the, if the electric field is too strong for that ion, it'll just crash into one of the poles. But at some point, it'll be exactly right, and it'll pass all the way through and you detect it. So by sweeping through, you can see all the different ions. Um, however, the current state of the art, or at least it was when I stopped sciencing, was the Fourier transform uh, internal cyclotron resonance, which is basically a, a particle accelerator. So you, you, you uh, blitz your sample, stick it into the particle accelerator, it whizzes through, and then you can select particles coming out, and that's incredibly accurate. It lets you really determine very small differences. 
Um, so what can you do with it? Um, yeah, like NMR, you can get a sample, so it doesn't have the same resolution as NMR, um, but you can find out what's in a sample. Uh, this can be useful for things like, say, you've got a new protein where you don't know what it does. You can break it down and then see what the individual pieces were. Something that is useful in medicine is um, you can use it diagnostically. So, for instance, say you take a urine sample from a normal patient, and then you take a urine sample from someone with, say, prostate cancer. Even though you might not know what the individual peaks are, if you can see a difference in profile, then maybe you can start to use that diagnostically. So you can check for prostate cancer from a, from a urine sample. Um, and yeah, and I think probably the most common usage in terms of what you guys will see is uh, testing for samples. So for instance, testing for the presence of explosives, presence of drugs, etc. Um, mass spec is kind of the, the go-to technology for that because it's, it's pretty cheap. Right, gene activity. Um, so this you may have heard of in terms of statements in like press releases like gene X was more you know, uh, active under these conditions. So I wanted to quickly dive into how on earth do you work that out. A quick uh, dive into transcription science. So um, I don't know how, uh, how, many, how much you guys have come across this, but um, you've got DNA, and then DNA is read in a process called transcription. So proteins read it, and then they create something called mRNA, which is effectively a, a copy. It's a single-stranded copy of the DNA. Uh, the mRNA is then read by another protein, and that's uh, turned into a protein. So the uh, DNA is read uh, to make mRNA, and mRNA is read, and that makes protein. Uh, quick aside, this is one of my favorite pieces of art, which is called Dance of the Polypeptides. It's in the States, and it's a, uh, a completely structurally accurate depiction of a protein being made. So you have the mRNA uh, depicted as the, the line, and then those, uh, the ribosomes making the, the growing protein. Uh, a touch I quite like is that the structure of the protein is accurate uh, for the, the thing that's coded on it. So they really went to great effort to make it accurate. So in your DNA, you've got a few things. Um, I think the important things to focus on here is you've got what's called the coding region, and that's the bit that the protein actually comes from. So at some point, that bit is read, and they make protein. But then upstream of that, you've got this kind of promoter area, which is where other proteins can attach and affect how much of the mRNA is made. So by some proteins will attach and cause more mRNA to be made, and some will attach and cause less. And that's where you get this whole idea of gene activity, with them being uh, active in different times and in different ways. So how do you measure it? Well, the old, way, the old way is you take your DNA and you replace your gene with a gene that you can measure. So in my case, I used a, uh, a protein that you, uh, catalyzed a chemical reaction. So by running the chemical reaction, you know how much of your protein was in there. You can also use fluorescence and things like that. However, the smart, there are some arguments against this technique, such as obviously you're interfering with the DNA downstream, so that might, that might affect um, the results. Um, and it's also considered a bit old world. Uh, when, I was, when I was wrapping up, the new world was this way. So I say DNA is turned into RNA, so you get this, this single-stranded version. So what you do is you make a little, a little bit that codes for the thing you're interested in, the RNA you're interested in. They will naturally, um, they will naturally associate, and when they do, uh, you can detect a fluorescence. So you attack a chemical marker that when they, when they have uh, bound, uh, it fluoresces. And so you can start to measure the amount of mRNA in the cell, and that's how you can measure the gene activity. Now, in terms of usefulness for, this is mostly useful for, um, for, for scientific research um, that aren't currently, um, as far as I'm aware, commercial or application of this, because it's quite a lengthy process. So it's not something you, know, you wouldn't go to a hospital and they just quick a jab and tell you how active your gene are, but it's something they could take a sample and then maybe tell you later down the line. But it's something that I think we might see more being more common. Right, uh, quickly, gravimeters. Uh, so these ones are pretty interesting. So they measure local gravity. Um, now. Gravity is obviously you know, gravity, but it's, it's based on mass. So the more mass, the more gravity. And on, on the Earth, that's the major mass, so that's where most of the gravity is coming from. But all of us have gravity. So it, much smaller, because we're much smaller, but very subtle differences in gravity depending on how big something is, how dense, etc. So measuring it very, very precisely can be interesting. And here's how you do it. Um, the old way is what's called a spring gravimeter. So what you do is you have a mass, which you know, and then you have a spring, which is what's called a zero-length spring, so it increases proportionally to the, uh, to the mass, so to the, the force on it, and then you measure how much the spring is stretching. So the weight is going to be the mass times the gravity, so any change in the spring is likely due to a, a gravity variation. Now, the problem with this is it's relative. So if you have two machines, you can't compare them because there's going to be very subtle differences in the springs. But if you have one machine, you can take multiple readings with that one machine and move that machine around and, and get valuable uh, information. Um, the current state of the art for relative is what's called a superconducting gravimeter. And what you do here is you get a niobium core and you suspend it in an electromagnet. So the core is trying to fall under gravity, but you're keeping it up with, a, with an electromagnetic field. Now, 
the amount of uh, energy you need to supply to keep the field going is going to be a function of how much gravity there is. So the more it's trying to fall, the more energy you're having to put in. So you can measure uh, gravity incredibly precisely this way. Um, Again, the problem is it's relative, so you can't compare two machines because of subtle differences in the setup, but um, you can get uh, relative, uh, relative values. To give you an idea of how sensitive these are, um, I was reading a thesis by one of uh, a guy in a Finnish lab who was working on this, and they found they were able to detect the gravity difference from when one of the workmen cleared the snow off the building that they were in. So just the weight of snow, they were able to detect the difference in mass from that not being there anymore, which is staggering if you think about it. Um, there are some absolute gravimeters. So um, the most common absolute gravimeter is you get a vacuum tube and a mirror, and you drop the mirror while timing it with a laser. So you have a, an atomic clock and a very accurate laser measure, and you, you time how long it took the mirror to fall in the vacuum, and that gives you a very, very precise ac uh, measurement for gravity that is uh, comparable. So once you've corrected for noise, you can compare different machines at different places. These are, these are pretty accurate. Current state of the art for absolute is what's called an atomic gravimeter which is where you have a, a cluster of atoms held in a, a laser trap in, in, in a vacuum. You then turn it off to let them fall. You then hit them with a laser to cause them to break apart, so you've now got different masses happening. They'll fall under gravity, and at the bottom you hit them with another laser to recombine them, and then look at the differences, and so you know what happened. You, you know that gravity was the same, but the masses were changing, so you can work out what gravity was at the time. And these, again, are, are super accurate. Um, a story I read was about when Stanford uh, Uni installed one of these. They were trying to calibrate, calibrate it in. They found they were able to detect the mass of the moon passing over, um, which, again, I find staggering. The other thing is they found there was a slight offset every Saturday, and they couldn't work out why until they realized they were detecting the mass of the crowd at the local sports stadium, which was just one building over. <laughs> Incredible stuff. So what can you use it for? Um, a lot of earth science stuff. So again, you can detect uh, differences in density, like if you've got nothing but granite beneath you, that's gonna be very different to if you've got granite and limestone beneath you. So you can, you can get kind of interesting readings about the earth and it's used very extensively for that. A major commercial application is that that lets you detect oil, because um, obviously oil has a different def density to, uh, to rock. The most interesting application I've, I've come across, though, is, is actually submarine navigation. So um, the Americans, for a fair while now, have been using uh, gravimeters to detect where, they, where the sub is underwater, like how close it is to the rock, because um, you don't want to send out a sonar because other people might detect that. So a gravimeter is a completely passive measurement. Um, an interesting aside here is that to film the Hunter Red October, the Americans um, let them film it in a real sub. And there's one scene in which you overhear one of the crew members shout out a reading in milligals, and milligals is a measurement of gravity. And at that point, the Soviets realized the Americans must be navigating with gravimetry because at that point, that was classified as top secret. Uh, uh, right, final one. Um, I can put a wedge down here if I'm in my favor. Um, AFM, uh, atomic force microscopy, and we're going to go into magnetic force microscopy. So you may have seen this in uh, news articles where they have incredibly detailed pictures of very tiny things. So here there is a, a this is DNA, um, and you see here a 200 nanometer scale, so incredibly accurate uh, uh, microscopic images. How do you get them? Yeah, way of taking picture of really tiny things. Um, how it works is actually quite surprising, so I want to quickly go into normal microscopy first. Normal microscopy is you get light, you shine it through a specimen, the specimen interferes with the light, and then you look at the light. light on a very small scale, light is quite big, a, so um, two they came up speech, with electron, uh, electron microscopes where you get a stream of electrons ordered in uh, as, as far as you can, because electrons are smaller than light is comparatively, you can get a better resolution, you can see smaller things, because there's uh, yeah, more disturbance that can happen. So how do you do AFM? What can, what can you do that's better than electron microscopy? Introducing the science stick. So um, atomic force microscope is effectively a very, very sharp stick it, on, on the order of atoms. So at the end, it's incredibly sharp to the point of atoms. And what you do is you very literally drag it over your sample and then use a laser, so have it on a cantilever, bounce a laser off the, uh, off the tip and see how much it went up when it hit stuff. <laughs> that's, that's honestly how they work. Um, so what can you use it for? You get incredibly high resolution images. So here again, are two yeah. pictures of atoms. I had so you've got here two, um, uh, carbon rings, and you can actually see the carbon rings. Yeah, um, the, the fact that this crude technology right. can produce yeah, yeah. images like that right, blows my mind. However, um, this is reaching into my current IP interest. And one of the more interesting uh, so applications of this is in forensics. So to dive very quickly into forensics, um, 
Traditional hard drives are um, spinning platters, you may have heard them called, and they're basically uh, magnetic storage. So data is stored as, as ones and zeros on the magnetic drive. And what that means is a, a one is, is magnetic and a zero isn't. So if you get an atomic force microscope and you magnetize the tip, you can actually start to measure the magnetism of something this, rather than like the, the height of it. So you can actually produce a picture of a hard drive like this. Now in this, the peaks um, no problem. Uh, are the ones and the, 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 the troughs are the zeros. So you can start to measure very, very accurately the magnetism of specific areas. Dream. The reason sure. this is no, interesting no is because um, computers, I was just you it's a bit heavy, right? file, uh, it, it, it right. doesn't. What it does is it takes the index of where that file is stored and erases it in the index. So if you just read into the hard disk, you can often find the file that was there because it's not been overwritten. If you want to securely erase something so that that can't be done, what you do is you have to write that data over with more data so that you can't just do this, it's now, it's now gone. However, magnetic fault microscopes are so accurate that you can determine the difference between a one that was overwritten with a zero and a zero that was overwritten with a zero. So even if you've overwritten the data, you can get such accurate measurements that you can actually start to recover the file that was written there previously before, uh, before the, uh, it, was, it was overwritten. Now this is quite obviously a very costly and time consuming process, so it's, it's very rarely done, but I think it's a really interesting application of the science. So conclusions. Um, however tiny things are, people seem to be able to measure them because they try hard enough. And sometimes these harebrained things actually end up quite useful in the everyday world. Um, I realize that's been quite a whirlwind tour, so I hope that was interesting. Um, I'm around if people want to chat about any of this more. Um, thanks for listening.